Hey, Coach Venturi, the world of football, at least in our little world of football, is up in arms because Darius Leonard didn't make the Pro Bowl. Based on who made it, not you know, because if you're going to say he made, he should have made it. Somebody should have been taken off. Um, should he have made it? And if so, who should have been taken off? Well, let me explain to you how I look at it. Okay. I, I think he probably should have made it, actually. And, uh, and, and, and basically, but the problem, here's the problem you have. And honestly, now, the people are knocking the Pro Bowl. Cause that, but, but listen, when you, get, when you get elected to, not so, you know, alternate's one thing, but when you get elected to the Pro Bowl, it's a big deal. Okay, yeah. it's a big deal. You have, you have 67% of those votes votes are your peers that's players and coaches and basically i all my years of 27 years of doing that i've never seen any team take it mildly nobody takes that mildly they take it there is a you know there is a 33 percent media fan deal but i think you know 67 percent is your peers and the thing about that is and it's it relates a little to leonard is when you're looking when it when it's a coach and a player, they don't look at it from an analytic standpoint. They don't, they're not stat guys because stats are misleading. They're even misleading in Leonard to some degree. What they look at is tape. Those guys look at the tape and the games they played against them and how they played. And they really and, and over the years, one thing I realized is that players in the NFL really respect total physicality. They the guys that are really physical on the field on the tape are guys that they treasure. It's just it's kind of a warrior thing. I don't know how to explain it. It's just there. It's just how we were bred, I guess. Um, and then, you know, it's very difficult, um, you know, plus, you know, that's usually a lot of money. Usually there's a big incentive um, in your contract for being elected to the Pro Bowl, not so much, you know, being a replacement, but being elected. There's usually a lot of money that goes into that. So it's a big deal on many levels. Now, what's kind of difficult at linebacker is that they pick five and three of them are rushers, and you really have to kind of separate your guys. I mean, you know, the outside guys like Vaughn Miller, you know, and those kind of guys that are on the outside, Clowney and them, that's really a different position than the linebacker that Leonard plays. Those guys are rush guys, and three of those five are going to be those guys. Okay, so, you know, those are your big sack guys, and, and, and so you can't, you, you really aren't in the same ball game, so you only really have two spots left at what I call the stack backers, or what we know as the guys that play off the line of scrimmage that flow. You know, I refer to them as stack backers, and so you only have two to start with. And you know, basically, you know, when you go into that, I wouldn't argue with Mosley, and you know, I think I, I think name recognition hurts you a little bit. You know, I mean, you know, those guys don't know Leonard's a household name here in Indianapolis already, and the teams that cover him, they, they you know, they see it. But throughout the league, he's not a household name like Mosley is. There's kind of the same kind of player. So, you know, Mosley's a pretty established player. The guy that I wouldn't agree with is McKinney from um, Houston. I would have put Leonard in over McKinney. Now, they're very different. And let me explain Leonard to you because, you know, he's becoming a folk hero here. and It's good. I mean, and there's nobody that I like more in terms of what he's done and where he's going. But he's really a unique kind of player um, when you look at him, he is a – you hear me talk about it at quarterback a lot. I'll say this guy is a great player, but he's an entity. He's not he – isn't, he isn't necessarily a pure quarterback. For instance, you know, I think that what I, what I see at Leonard is – I see Leonard is to Deshaun Watson – what Ray Lewis and Mike Singletary are to Drew Brees, okay? In other words, what Leonard is right now is a ball magnet. He's a playmaker. I mean, he's a guy that, you know, particularly on loose plays – he is terrific. I mean, he can run you down. He not he can he can get the ball out. He can strip it out. Um, he can knock down a pass. Uh, he can jet to the quarterback, although with one exception, every sack has been really a scheme sack, you know, which people on the outside don't understand that totally, but it's, it is there. 
Um, he's going to make a lot of tackles in that position. There's no question about it. He's going to make a lot of tackles because, first of all, he's covered every single down so nobody can get to him. And so, you know, he's going to make a lot of tackles. And plus, if you complete seven out of ten passes that you throw inside the defense in front, that will linebacker, that guy that stays in three downs, is going to make a million tackles. So we don't get over, in my world, we don't get over thrilled with that. Now, this kid, I think I would have put him in there over McKinney. McKinney's just the opposite. McKinney from Houston is a guy that is a slugger inside. I mean, he's a thug. And I, I mean that as a positive. I don't mean that as a negative or a slur. He's a thug inside. McKinney's a very tough inside backer, very good from C-gap to C-gap. But he can't play in space even close to Leonard. I mean, as a matter of fact, he's a guy that you work on. He's a guy that you game plan to get to. Now, not Mosley. Mosley's like Leonard. Mosley can run and hit. Uh, so I would have definitely put him over McKinney. But you know what? In the long run, he's got a long way to go. Uh, I know people here don't believe that, but he is not the best in-line linebacker. If you if you can isolate him and run right at him, uh, actually Walker's probably better C-gap to C-gap, to be honest with you. But it, he's overwhelmingly good enough because of the loose plays and his ability to make the play at the right time. So, you know, his days are coming. There's no question about it. And, you know, the good news is he takes that if like like he needed another chip on his shoulder. He just got it, man. Right, right. I mean, and, and there's nothing really better. Uh, I mean, don't make him a folk hero yet. Let him keep playing. Let him keep get it better. Um, I mean, I what I what I like about Leonard more than anything is the playmaker ability. A, he's he's been a game saver. But B, he's got a high ceiling. He's got a lot left because he's going to get a lot more physical. He's going to get a lot more impactive. But he doesn't. He doesn't knock guys back like Singletary or like Ray Lewis. That's why I said he is like a Deshaun Watson like right now. They're not perfect at their position, but they're playmaking sons of guns. You know, they just yeah. they have rare ability to do that. And I think he, because of his temperament and what he has, he can become that Singletary. He can become that Ray Lewis. Now I'm talking about guys with gold jackets. You know what I'm saying? So when I'm when I'm saying that's where he's got to get, I'm not being demeaning at all. So you know I can understand it. I would have put him in there. I don't think it is. Um, it's crazy. He probably isn't as maybe quite as highly respected by throughout the league by the rest of the of the, of the players as he maybe is a media darling because of those numbers. You said this via text to me, and man, is it true. This, you know, the whole idea local saying, well, this is a bend but don't break defense. Yes, maybe seven weeks ago, but there's a blitz element to this. This makes this an interesting defense, no? There's no question about it. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that at this moment in time, the Colts are legit. Now, I wouldn't have told you that five weeks ago because – the way they were playing defense, the style which which they were playing, totally was not going to make it. It just was not going to make it. And understand this, and you'll get a kick out of this one. First of all, bend but don't break is a media term. It is not Absolutely. a coaching term. Absolutely. Of course term. it is. Yes. yes <laughs> I always course. had to laugh about that because I would get accused of that when we were just average and I was just trying to hold on. And I guarantee you, Matt Eberfloss doesn't go in when he puts in a defense and say, okay, on this one then, we can bend a little bit, yeah, okay? right. I choose to say this, is that basically when they started out this defense and what the system itself – is is made to do it's made to play what i call top down in other words first thing it does is it doesn't let you over the top okay and that's kind of the zone nature of the defense cover two cover three don't let anybody over the top and then the second element is the squeeze element and the third element is the choke element well we we were doing the first one early playing a lot of cover two a lot of cover three um uh, you know, we were even even when we weren't very good going all the way back to preseason games. I did. We weren't letting people get over the top. We were very very seldom letting that happen. Uh, and then we would play good in the red zone because now the the soft zones. You know, the areas just tighten up. There's just everything gets tight. 
There's no separation between your linebackers and safeties. And because of that, we weren't giving up a ton of points. You know, we were always, you know, given, we were giving up a ton of yards and ball possession and, and that type of thing. And, we, you know, we got rush early and then it just died. And teams kind of caught up with that. And we went through a stage there where we played um, Brady and Darnold and Carr and Bortles in game one, and we weren't very good at all. I mean, if it's not for two just great individual plays, one by Kenny Moore and one by uh, Leonard, you know, we may lose all four of those games, and we didn't play very good, and we, we didn't play good enough defense to win. But I give them credit. Whatever happened, whether they sat down as a staff, whether Matt did it, uh, you know, whether uh, Ballard was involved. Because understand this, this is Ballard's defense. This is what he wanted here. Um, and I think Ibrahim would have probably ended up here even if it hadn't been uh, even hadn't been for McDaniel's because this is exactly the vision that that Chris has. I know this. This was him in Chicago. This is what he wanted. This is the team he wanted to be, and because he understands how to build it, how to do it, and so forth and so on. But what they did is they made – now, it isn't as evident to the fans other than the blitzes. I mean, I think everybody sees that. But somebody like myself, who studies every single down, every single nuance, every single X and O you did, there was a substantial change before the Tennessee game. The first one is the obvious one. We got much more proactive in pressure defenses. I mean, the first three third downs – of the Tennessee game, part of it was we wanted to get a five-man rush against Mariota, but we came after his ass and set the tempo. You know, the second thing is is we began to tighten our zones. We were just – I couldn't even watch it for a while. I mean, we were, we were conceding yardage in those no-cover zones, and people were just bleeding us, bleeding us, bleeding us. At one point in the season, we were down six minutes in time of possession. So all of a sudden now – you start pressuring. You start tightening down the zones. Then we started to add the quarter package. I think I talked about it last week, but what the quarter package does that the zones don't do is the quarters allow your underneath linebackers, they, it allows them to choke routes underneath because it, it's like a match. When you're playing quarters, it gives you the form of a matchup zone underneath with backup help by the four quarters. So by adding pressure, by adding the um, uh, by adding the quarters to it, which really helped us last week against um, not so much against Amari Cooper, but it really helped us against Hopkins. And then we did, and these were things that I was critical of. And if they were doing them today, I'd still be critical because I know what I'm talking about. Okay, when they get the the third thing that they did is they did a, they started to do a much better job of concealing the coverage. Four weeks ago. They would play man-to-man free, and they would line up in it, and everybody knew it, and they'd audible to rub routes. I mean, I can take you back to games and show it to you. But now in the last four weeks, the concealment element has come into it. And when you add all these things, what we've recaptured is we've recaptured that pressure up front. Some of it's five. We even used six-man pressure last week. Plus, when you start doing that, what it does is when you do go four-man rush and you do go zone, you're so much better now because all of a sudden it's in the mix. It isn't the only thing that you're doing. And you're seeing our defensive line become impactive again. And I think one little strategic thing that they've done that has been great also in the last month is they've taken the two tackles. Now, normally when you play the two tackles, what happens is is that Hunt plays – on the shade of the center, which we call a one technique. That's a zero shade. And then Autry plays on the three, which is the outside shoulder of the guard. Well, what we've been doing since Tennessee is we've been jumping both those guys down into that A-gap. We're double A-gap. And I'm telling you, they are raising all kinds of hell. You can't run. It's very difficult to block them. You know, it'll be interesting to see what these last two opponents, particularly Tennessee, who has seen it in that last week. But those things have been great and then I would say that the biggest thing in personnel wise is the emergence of Autry. Autry has gone from a solid you know player rotational player at the Raiders looks solid early 
he has gone to an ambient player. He is a guy that right now, if you're on Tuesday night as an offensive coordinator, you want to know where Autry is on every single down because that guy has become an impact player. So hats off to them. However it happened, it really doesn't matter. But they made substantial. And nobody's going to admit to that because no coaches do that. They don't, they don't want to tell you, well, we should have been doing this before. They made some significant changes in there. And, man, oh, man, they are legitimate. Now, there's no question in my mind, and that's why I don't think anybody wants us in the tournament. I mean, you know, when you have an offense that's eighth and a defense that's tenth, and basically same thing with scoring, we're eighth in scoring, and now that's the bigger statistic, we're tenth in points given up. That's not a team you want in the tournament if you're opponent. Coach, when you look at the Colts' offense and the running game, and the running game being so good, two things come to mind. One, uh, maybe the line is really good. How much better is it with Ryan Kelly? And two, I see Marlon Mack, and I see a, uh, I see a quick guy. I yeah. see, you know, I see some speed. I think there's several things involved in the running game. I mean, and they're all good. Okay, first of all, I think that Frank and uh, Sirianni do a really good job of mix. Okay, they're never going to let you know what we're going to do. They don't come out necessarily to establish something. They come out to attack you. I mean, the first series last week, we come right off the bat, and I was hoping we'd do this. We come out and spread and just go quick rhythm, quick rhythm, quick rhythm, which immediately puts Dallas in those zones in their heels, force them to play man-to-man, which isn't as good on the run. Okay, so we do that, and we, you know, they're, they're worrying about that stuff. we got a good quick rhythm passing game. And now what they do, what they've done a really good job of, and our line is good. There's no question about it. It is good. I mean, you know, we went for years here where it was from hunger, but it is really, really good. So the second thing is the design of the running game. You know, things I said last week to you, we got to run right at these linebackers. These linebackers can run, but if you get right after Smith, he's light. You can get after Van Der Esch. You know, I can say it on Wednesday, but doing it is two different things. I said if you go right, make sure you pinch Lawrence. If you go left, run the toss crack to Crawford. Well, we did all of them, but what we did great was how we did it, okay? First of all, we came in, we ran what we call wham plays, and they used Hewitt on this. Hewitt is kind of a, you know, under the radar guy, but he goes in and he blocks in interior linemen, which allow your guards and center to go right now because you're fin- you're not blocking that nose tackle with the center. It allows Kelly and Haig or Kelly and Nelson to go right now, and they just kill those linemen. Those guys that were so good coming in. They did. It was it was creative. It was sharp, and our guys did a good job. When we ran the toss crack, Nelson blocked down. Costanzo kicked out. The penalty was ridiculous. The guy just get out of the way, and then you got Kelly pulling around the hole. I'm going to get into Kelly. When we ran it over to the other side, we doubled and pulled. Our tackles are pulling on those counter plays. Both Smitty one side, Costanzo. I said weeks ago, this is really one of the most athletic lines you're seeing, and they're using it so. You know, there was really a lot. There's been more creativity in our running game than I've seen in the years in the league. And I mean that sincerely. I've said that at different occasions. Mac is outstanding. Mac is a guy, all Mac has to prove to us over time is that he's durable to play 16 Sundays. He has proven to you now that he will take the ball north and south. He used to be kind of a home run or strikeout guy. In other words, everything coming out of South Florida, and I studied him. I knew him very well. I was thrilled when we got him on the fourth round. He's He was a bounce player. Even as a rookie, everything was bounced to the outside. Stutter go, and that's why there'd be losses or big gains. Now, you know, whether it's Rathman or how they're doing it, but they have gotten him north north and south, and he ran with grit in those two inside plays to, for that first touchdown. I mean, he is tougher than all get out. I, I mean, that was the biggest surprise to me in the game, that we could take the Dallas run defense and kill it like we did. I mean, just kill it. Now, to part of the other question, there's no no question what Kelly means to us. And, it, and I, I wasn't sure, and now being without him and then having him back, 
there's no doubt about it. The kid really and truly, he's an alternate pro bowler, but he needs to be in there. He's the most underrated guy right now. And the, what he does for you, Dan, is he is so athletic at center. He's not a number one for nothing. I mean, he gets up and he cuts those linebackers off. So if you're running left and Van Der Esch is to our right and you're running and you're going to scoop with him, he can, pull, he can get Van Der Esch cut off. Plus, he can pull and run and go. I mean, you know, there's not – a lot of centers can't do that. You know, they really can. I mean, he's outstanding. And the other guy – that I want to give a little love to. And, uh, you know, he's not going to be mentioned very much, but he he made a difference Sunday and could make a big difference going forward, and that's Allie Cox. I'm telling you, having Kelly back and Allie Cox meant the world to us because Allie Cox might not be as physical as Doyle yet because he hasn't played a lot, but he did a pretty good job on that edge. He does a much better job than anybody else we have. I mean, he gives us – a presentable guy without having to put a specialist in. Now, we did play some specialists. We did put LaRaven Clark at that tight end. And ironically, I think Clark is better than Haig, not inside, but on the edge because he's a little quicker as a tight end. So we were creative in that we weren't, we weren't afraid to use a kind of a, a big package, a big 12, what I call, where he plays the tight end. So, you know, but having Cox in there, you don't have to show it now. We can go to two tight ends and have an adequate blocker at tight end and a guy that, you know, potentially is a good receiver as well. So, you know, I think Cox and, and, uh, and, and, and Kelly made a big difference. And the other thing that I think is I think that what, what has happened to Haig, I liked Haig coming out of North Dakota State. I, I studied him in great detail. I thought he was a bargain when we got him. Uh, at, at on the fifth round, but I never ever believed that he should be a tackle. Okay, and because he's versatile, and we've had all kinds of issues, and we never had direction on where we were going, he's been kind of the Swiss Army knife: guard one week, tackle one week, so, you know, even a backup center. I mean, he's had to do all that, and so eventually he gets caught because he doesn't get technically sound. And I've never, I've always felt like he's a little top heavy, a little stiff, and if he gets out on those at the the wider he gets out on the edge, the more it shows, the more he lunges. But I always thought his best position would be right guard if you had to say, this is where this guy slots in. And so he stepped in for Logowinski and did a terrific job, really. I, got, I, I have him one, one got beat great in there. I mean, he did a really good job. And I, you know, as, as great as things as there was Sunday, you pitch a shutout, that's like a no-hitter. And where the defense did so well, you know, particularly early, is the defense defended every inch of that field. I mean, they're down on the goal line, and they, they and, and every every tough situation, the fourth downs that they made to play. How about the third and two? That's critical, and and Desir goes back and strips the ball from the tight end. I mean, it wasn't like we were the '85 Bears and dominated the first half. We didn't, but what we did was we made critical plays in some cases in disadvantaged situations. I mean. We bust through on the fourth and one. I mean, the Zier's play there. I mean, really, we did a good job. And then once we got that lead, once once we got that second half lead, it was over. And you know, our old adage, which you and I talk about every single week. I thought I thought the magic number this week was ten. Okay, and and this is how I look at it. Um, first of all, Dallas left ten points on the board. Okay, they didn't. You know, Autry blocks the field goal. Great special teams play. That's three. And then the fullback drops the ball in the end zone. And if you get that, that's 10 points. That's a 10-point swing. It's more than that because we scored off them. But when Dallas left 10 on the field, they never, ever recovered momentum again, and we established it. But the other 10, the big 10 that was the dagger that, you know, was before the half, and after the half, you and I talk about that during the game, after the game. The biggest drive, because it's still a 7-0 game, really. It's a 7 to nothing game. We've played well, but we're not by any way in control of it. I think Dallas had the ball two-thirds of the first half. Yep. And we go down, and we drive, make a great drive. Andrew has another breakout run in the two-minute drill. We go down, we kick the field goal. We come back, we go on a long drive, and we hit seven. So that 10 points around the half took that game from 7-0 and a little bit nervous to 
17-0. Once we get two scores with our defense, you are dead. You're dead in the water. You're not gonna. You're not gonna do it. And then we went from, you know, playing efficient and playing good in critical situations to just dominating their ass the rest of the way. We just dominated the second half. <laughs> um, is Eli Manning as good or as bad? I mean, where is Eli Manning? You know, uh, where, where is he? Well, at this point, it's he, he, he's really up and down, and that's, uh, that's the good news and the bad news. Um, he hasn't had a very good year. Uh, his body language last week was at an all-time low. Uh, Danny, he's 27th in the league in the QBR. Now, you know, part of that is the rest of the outfit. I mean, they, they have a bad offensive line. Um, you know, even with Barkley, who has Barkley, who has 1,800 total yards. I mean, he's got he's got 1,100 rushing yards and 82 catches. I mean, he he's not going to make 100, but if you get 1,000 and 100, there's only two guys in history that's ever done that. And you know, so even with that, though, they're 25th in rushing and offensive line. Uh, 29th in sacks given up with a QBR of 27, and that has been their Waterloo. Um, you know, they've been inconsistent. Uh, when Beckham's there, they're a much better team. You know, he's enigmatic to say the least, but in terms of pure talent, when he's there, um, he gives them a dimension that is amazing. I mean, he's a three-time Pro Bowler. You know, you think he's having a bad year, and then you look up, and he's got 77 catches for 1,005 yards. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's, it's not like he isn't. And so, you know, they struggle, but their biggest Waterloo has been – their offensive line from the beginning of the season till now, and he just he just hasn't looked very sharp. I mean, he needs protection. He's not a guy, you know, like guys we've been playing that can get out of trouble and that can make things happen. We've seen a lot of that lately where you have to be careful on the edge. With him, you don't have to be careful. You can stunt. You can do whatever you want to because he's not going to beat you with his legs. He's really kind of old-school, legitimate guy. Now, at the same time, I mean, this team, and I, and I say this in my videos, I mean, you know, don't for one reason. If you, if you relax at all in the National Football League, which I don't see we will, I think there's just too much at stake. I mean, you can have what happened at Jackson. Bill. I mean, this is a guy that I'm, I'm knocking him a little bit here, and I, I think he deserves it, but he's won two Super Bowls. I mean, it's, it isn't like he can't come in here, and if you get passive, that he can't have a great day, and I assume Beckham will play, and you got Barkley, who's a terrific player. I mean, he's right there. Gurley, him, and Ezekiel Elliott are very special, special cats, I mean, to be honest with you. And if Beckham's there, then Shepard gets better at the slot. they got a young tight end in Ingram that's coming on. I mean, Everybody in this league has enough skills that that on a given Sunday is there. So, I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, I think he's scary in that he hasn't played very well, but he's capable. I mean, at the same time, this is a team with five wins. But understand this. This is a team that has beat the Texans. They beat the Bears. Those are two division leaders. And they're actually 2-1 and one in December, even though they had a stinker last week. So, you know, you definitely have to be ready. They've got enough skill on offense if they can stay in ahead in the count with Beckham. Without Beckham, then no. Then, then you, you know, now you can load the box, stop Barkley, and basically stuff everybody else. But you add Beckham to the equation now – then every, everything gets better from a domino standpoint. Coach, I was listening. Greg Doyle put a tweet out that, you know, football folks are downplaying the running back, but, boy, Zeke Elliott's a good you know weapon to have. And I agreed with him until I looked up and I thought, man – they haven't scored yet. So well, you know, yeah, that that's exactly and, right and now. So is Beckham like I agree with Greg. He's a hell of a weapon. Beck or a uh, 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 Barkley's a hell of a weapon. But you got to score points. I mean, is there, you know, Well, remember what I told what remember what I said to you in the first quarter and I felt really good about going into the Cowboys game much better than I did Houston because I was worried about Houston in how they used Hopkins inside and how we didn't handle him in the first game, but we did handle him in the second game. I wasn't nearly as concerned with Amari Cooper because he's a downfield, yeah. run over the top of you guy, and we're not going to let that happen. We didn't let it happen in preseason. We ain't going to let it happen now. And I told you that going in. And what I kept telling you during the game is uh, Ezekiel will get his yards. 
But what did I say to you? No Cooper, no points. Yeah, no Cooper, no still points. a league, even Belichick said it yesterday, this is still a league where you have to be able to throw the ball to win. Now, if you have a balance like we're achieving, then the running game is very important. It gets very important if you have a lead. It gets very important in four minutes. And you're talking about Gurley and Ezekiel and Barkley now who are – they are great players. They're not they're not good backs now. They are great special guys that can catch it and beat you for a touchdown, run it, hit home. Those are home run hitters. Those guys are sprint champions in high school. Those guys are not, you know, just solid guys and they can they can play every down. But just look at it sometimes, Dan. I mean if you lead the league in rushing, let's say you're four point five, okay? How many how many runs does it take to score a touchdown? I mean that's a lot. If you even if you got four point five every game, you know to get a hundred yards, you got to you got to carry the ball twenty five times to get a hundred. Right. Okay? Right. So, I mean, especially if you don't break one. So you know, I always thought you know the running game is really important, but it's overrated in that I used to say it's a slow death. I'll take the slow death because. And and that's what we you know now we stop the run here with penetration. There's no question about that. But if when we used to play Dan Marino, I used to say let's just take let's keep him to let's keep him to seventy percent or sixty five percent of what he normally throws for. And if they run the ball, basically they're killing clock. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so I, I it's it's, it's impo- that's why the quarterback position is of such value because I just don't think. You know, unless you have a historic defense, that is, you know, the 85 Bears, um, maybe the Tampa 2000, the Ravens, whenever, you know, when they won it, those were, and even Denver was close. But, I mean, those three teams are historic defenses that you play with a manager, a quarterback. But those are few and far between. You have to be able to throw the ball in the National Football League, and you have to be able to stop the pass in the National Football League, either rushing it or, or covering it. I, so I don't know how I'm answering that question, but no, I, 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 get I, it. I just think that, you know, and this is why Beckham means so much to you. And, you know, everything is dominoes. That's why the, the guy that's so important to us, even though sometimes his numbers always aren't as great, is Hilton. Because when Hilton is there, Hilton creates a matchup problem, just like he's going to create a terrible matchup problem for the Giants. And, you know, he did it He did it to the Houston Texans. And so what I look for, I, I've told you this before, when I start watching a game, the first thing I look at, believe it or not, is how are they defending Hilton, okay? Because if they're playing him one-on-one, he's going to get a – he's going to have a big day. Now – if they if they have to move somebody out or over to stop him, then Ebron's going to have a big day, and Max going to have a. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's dominoes. Yeah, yeah he's but, the guy that sets it I, up. I, the first thing I look at strategically, because I look at the game so strategically, is where is how are they going to stop Hilton? And that's when Beckham's in the game. Now all of a sudden, now you have to defend wider and deeper. You know what I'm saying? You can't now. If Beckham's not in the game, if Shepard's number one, I got a hundred guys on that line of scrimmage, and Barkley ain't gonna breathe. Yeah. Hey, coach. Let me let me ask you because you know it's coming down to you know these two games for the Colts, but it's also coming down to you know positioning and who's good. Yeah. I, put, I, yeah. put a, I put a poll out yesterday, and it wasn't you know obviously it's not scientific, and most people are Colts fans, so I know where it's going to go, but. Is there right now, I'm not talking about like you said earlier when, you know, the defense was what it was. The Colts have evolved and you got to give even. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody in the AFC playing better than the Colts? I don't think so. I don't think on both sides of the ball that anybody is. I just went through our our potential, you know, because what I look for now is anybody that's in the wild card hunt or, or leading a division is playing pretty good in some areas. So, but but what I look for, what you got to look for, is not where they're playing good. Do they have big liabilities? And right now, where the Colts are very very good, is is let's just go with the big three that I look for. Okay, I look for points given up number one because that's not just defense. That's not turning it over. That's special teams. We're in the top ten. Okay, Andrew is number eight in QBR, and we're plus two in turnover differential. So if you look at us and you go across the board, we probably have more balance in terms of strength. Now, you can look at Baltimore. You know, they're number one in defense, 
But really, between Flacco and the quarterback, their QBR is down in the bottom 20, and they're minus 7 in turnover differential. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a plus 8 on offense. You know, I mean, plus 8 in points given up. Ben is number 4 quarterback. That's really good. But they're a minus 9 in turnovers. I mean, New England, who you think is really good, they're 23rd on defense, Coach, 23rd. Houston is pretty solid. They're pretty much like us, but not as good as us. They're 14th, uh, 14th in points given up. Uh, Watson is 14th in QBR. And they're, where they're great is a plus 10 on the turnover thing. So, you know, if you look at it, you look at Kansas City, their defense is not very good. I mean, you know, you, you could almost make the case that San Diego's playing better than anybody, and I haven't really watched them. But I see, I can't, I can't see anybody that we can't play with. I just don't see it. I don't think that this is a year of a super team. You know, we thought for a while it was Kansas City and the Rams, and you know they've got those warts because in this league, if you have liabilities, they can be exploited week to week. And I don't see any team that's not flawed. Even if you got all the way to the Super. Bowl, okay, and you played the Saints. The Saints are just another team outside of New Orleans. I, if you had to go to New Orleans to play them, just like I don't think Pittsburgh can beat them in New Orleans. I don't think, you know, and that this is why I think we're sitting in a great position right now because we've got it now. All the player needs to do, a player don't need to go out nowhere. He don't need to listen to our show. He don't need to listen to TV right now because everybody's going to tell him how good he is, and he don't need it. What he needs to do is beat the New York Giants. That's all his focus is. But big picture, guys like you and I, I don't get. I don't. I think Pittsburgh's got a tough duty going to New Orleans. I think. I think the Ravens got a real tough duty going to San Diego. So you know, and, and we're gonna and we're gonna play Tennessee. So we'll decide that. Okay, one way or another. But when you look at those games, you could be sitting. You know, you could be sitting Monday morning definitely in the wild card position. Do you think they will? I do. Ultimately, you think they will? I ultimately do because I don't. I I just. And I, you know, again, I may be wrong, but let, let me say this to you: if if you were betting, not recreational, but betting for your living, would you bet Pittsburgh against New Orleans in New Orleans, or would you bet Baltimore against um, uh, San Diego in San Diego, and would you bet the Colts against the Giants? Because that's all you're talking about. No, you're right. I, I hey, look, you're exactly right. And I told. Then, I, I mean, agree. we have to beat Tennessee, which is not easy. But no, one good thing on Tennessee, because I obviously I've done a ton of Tennessee, you know. Cause, but but you know, we got some good news there. I mean, they just rule Conklin out for the rest of the season, who's their stellar, stellar right tackle and their best defensive back, Logan Ryan. He's done broken fibula. So I mean, those kind of things just they're little things, but they really really help you. And so I mean, you know, and again, you just you take care of business. And I've said this all along. There's so much balance in the league. The league is going to come to you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, look. I, I, and, Dan, you know I, what's I, important? It's really important. You know, and I, I'm sure it's this way in basketball. That's why I, I didn't always want to buy in the playoffs. And, and I think the Colts, you know, the Colts in many cases were one and done a lot because they sat on it for a week as, a, as the buy team. I'll be honest with you. You want to be hot in December – and who in the hell is hotter than the Colts right now? Right. Seriously, I mean, we just won the state championship, and we, you know, I'm in Texas state championship, and we did, we just devoured the Cowboys. So, I mean, that's the way it is. Appreciate you, boss man. What do you got this weekend? What are you doing? Well, you know, I'm 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 really excited right now. You know, I've got uh, with the videos will be out tomorrow. Yes, sir. I'm you know. December. Wait, wait, wait. Colts.com people, good videos. Yeah. Coach going to give you everything you need offensively, then defensively Friday, then of course Saturday we get it going with a little bit of you know. You know, and I'm just I'm just really cranked. My daughter's coming in from San Francisco Friday night. We got the whole family here, but there's just nothing like December football. And I'll tell you what, would it be great for these guys to get in this hunt because there is nothing and you know it you've experienced it there's nothing like playoff football nothing. for a young team absolutely nothing cuz that thing the eyes of the world are on you then and that and that intensity picks up one more level but you know Frank and Matt and these guys they got them playing i mean this whole operation from Ballard on down i mean you got to take your hat off to them i mean it's really it's been a, an amazing it's been an amazing first year here 
Appreciate you, boss. Thank you. All right, Dan. Have All a good right. one. That's Coach Rick Venturi presented by the District Tab. I just went there yesterday. Bought a $50 gift card from a Mi Familia.